everyone. Thanks again for tuning in with me today. Today's game we'll be looking at is Ghosts and Goblins for the NES. Now, before I review this game, people might ask why I'm reviewing a game that's been reviewed a thousand times already. Well, my review is going to be a little bit different. Not only will I tell you stuff you may not have known about this game, but I'll also be showing you the Japanese version. Not that it's any different from the USA version besides the title screen. Ghosts and Goblins, known as Makai Mura or Hell Village in Japan, was developed by Capcom, but the NES version was programmed by Kazuo Yagi from Micronix, which explains why this game isn't exactly as good as the arcade version. Could they have hired a second programmer? I don't know, maybe Kazuo wanted to do it all by himself or something. Ghosts and Goblins was released in Japan on June 13th, 1986, North America in November 1986, and released in Europe on March 23rd, 1989. The game was also released for the Wii, 3DS, and Wii U virtual consoles in Japan, North America, Europe, and Australia, so there's many places to get a hold of this game. The NES version of Ghosts and Goblins had a short development team. The planning was by Kazuo Hasegawa and Takuro Fujiwara, music by Harumi Fujita and Ayako Mori, designed by Masahiko Kurokawa and Kazuo Hasegawa, and programmed by Kazuo Yagi. Bet you probably didn't know that, did you? Anyway, let's get on to the review. By now, I'm sure everyone knows the game's story. You, Sir Arthur the Knight, are laying with Princess Prin Prin, chilling out in your underwear when all of a sudden, Satan comes and takes your girl- Wait a minute, Satan? Did Nintendo of America have a policy for not including religious references in their games? How did Capcom manage to get away with this? There are million dollar questions like, what is the meaning of life? Where is the holy grail? Are video games art? Are tiger games real games? Well, I've got one. How did Capcom manage to get away with having religious references in their NES games? I guess we'll never find out. And no, I'm not complaining about this because of my Christian faith, I promise you. Well, let's move on before I start ranting about this instead of reviewing the game. Ghosts and Goblins is known for its ridiculous difficulty. Anybody who's played this game shares the exact frustration. Now, there's a fine line between games that are challenging for the right reasons, and games that are challenging for the wrong reasons. This game, while incorporating elements of the former, mostly is the latter. This game has some both minor and major problems, and I'm sure with the help of another programmer, this game could have been an arcade perfect port. But since this game was programmed by just one person, you know it's not going to end up like that. There are six stages in this game, well a seventh one is a final boss battle, but most of the time you'll only live to see the first stage, and getting past the first level itself should win you a platinum medal. It's that hard. But the absolute worst part of this game is you have to beat the game twice, not once, TWICE in order to get the good ending. It's as if the game wasn't hard enough and the programmer thought, Oh man, it's it not hard enough. I don't make harder. Oh, oh, I know, I program it, so you have to be twice. So anyway, when you beat the game the first time, you'll get a bad English ending saying this game was all an illusion and will be sent back to the first stage to play the real six stages. Seriously? What's up with this English? Could they not proofread this? Yes, they could have. Or maybe not. Capcom had a USA division which published this game but the game was probably so hard that even the staff there couldn't beat it. Either that, or the American staff thought it was so funny they just decided to leave it in there. Though to be fair, imagine yourself trying to write a game in a language you didn't know all that well. When you start the game, you'll have to use your trusty daggers against the enemies of stage 1, but they will also drop some weapons occasionally. All of the weapons have their advantages and disadvantages. You have a fireball, for instance, which fires in an arc-like pattern. I know AVGN complained about this, but I personally have no problem with it. Then again, it could be that it becomes a problem on the second stage. I wouldn't know since I can't even get through the first stage. You will also need a shield weapon for the final boss, or else you'll be sent back to the previous stage. Again, as if the game wasn't hard enough. Unfortunately, all you're gonna see in this gameplay footage is the first half of the first stage, because I can't get past Firebrand. All he does is fly in the air, hit me a couple times, and I'm dead. Oh yeah, there's another major problem with this game. You die in two hits. Two pesky little fucking hits. Now, I don't mean to swear, but if you played this game, you do the same thing. How fair is it that some of the enemies get more health than you? If you could take maybe five hits, then I think you'd probably get a fighting chance. But two hits? That's just way too low. What were they thinking? Wait, what's that? I can't say what were they thinking? Oh, okay. 
I mean, I have to wonder what the game designers were thinking when they were developing this. Another huge issue is stage 6. You have to get a shield as a weapon or else you'll be taken to the previous stage when you finish. Oh, and by the way, best of luck completing stage 6. It would be easier to nail a CD to a fan with your ass singing Justin Bieber while trying to learn to play like usual Wang while screwing her at the same time. Now, if you didn't think that was bad enough, there's a time limit! Yeah! As if the game wasn't hard enough! Now you have to beat the stage within the allotted time! It's not enough that the levels are near impossible themselves, but a time limit too! Just as an additional kick to the balls. I don't mean to hammer this in, but when you play the last stages, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm currently working on a survivor's journal for the first stage of this game. It's coming out this winter at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. George Takei is going to narrate it for me. Here's a little excerpt from it. In the first stage, like James Rolfe said, you want to get the dagger. In the first stage, the zombies are programmed to randomly pop up out of anywhere, sometimes having them spawn right into you and you get hit. This can usually be avoided by simply crouching and shooting. Did you like that? It's gonna be $19.99 plus the frustration fee of $9,099. Would you buy it for that price? Nice! I knew that was a fair deal! There's also a little glitch in this game that actually helps. When you lose all of your lives and get a game over, guess what? It's not really game over, as you can start the stage you died at. No, this doesn't affect the ending in any way. I heard that it's not in the Japanese version, though. I wouldn't know because I can't even get past the first stage! This had to be a mistake. Otherwise, why not just let the player have unlimited lives? It's the exact same thing, except you have to watch the intro cutscene when you start and see the map after you die. You can't skip these either, believe me, I tried. That's a load of Fox McCloud testicles. I, I, I don't know why I said that. Anyways, it's time to talk about the game itself. The game is a simple side-scroller where you have to get from the left side of the screen to the right, or sometimes bottom to the top, defending yourself against hordes of enemies all the while. As I said before, you only get a measly two hits. The first time you get hit, you'll be left to fend for yourself in your undies. The second time, you turn into a pile of bones. If you try and play through this game, I can guarantee a few things. Controllers will be thrown, TVs will be broken, hair roots will be torn, game and console will be obliterated, you will scream out every curse word in the English language. Hey, I said it was simple, I never said it was easy. The graphics in this game are decent. For 1986, I won't complain. After all, this was only a few years after the Famicom was released in Japan. Sometimes projectiles can blend into the background, which is a problem, but it didn't really happen that often for me. Also, the game doesn't look monochrome. The game uses quite a few colors that make the game look okay for its time. So, overall, the graphics are decent, but I don't think I'd call them good. The music in Ghosts and Goblins is really good. The reason I say this is not only is it ported from the arcade version, but it was also ported by the same composer of the arcade version, Ayako Mori, who left Capcom shortly after. Ayako used a sound engine by the infamous Yoshihiro Sakaguchi. Is it as good as the original arcade soundtrack? Obviously not, because the NES can't live up to the arcade counterpart, but it's good that they got the original composer of the arcade game to also work on the NES version. It makes the music that more authentic. Sound effects, on the other hand, not so good. Not all of them are bad, but those freaking forest ghosts, which I'd refer to them as burrito ghosts, make the most piercing noise. In fact, I can't decide what's worse, the burrito ghosts in this game or the bats from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and I'm really curious to hear what the arcade versions sound like. Harumi Fujita did the sound effects for the NES version, by the way. She's the same composer who did infamous soundtracks such as Willow and Strider on the NES, the arcade version of Bionic Commando, and Sky Blitzer on the Super Nintendo, just to name a few. So, with all that said, if I had to rate Ghosts and Goblins on the NES, I would give it a 2 out of 5. It's a decent port, but I'm sure with another programmer, the game would have been that much better. Oh well, time machines don't exist. At least not to the general public, so going back in time would not be possible. It's really too bad. This game's got good controls, graphics, and music, but the game is just way too hard, and for all the wrong reasons. If you want to pick up a physical copy of this game, either because you want to experience it for yourself or just relive your childhood, you can get the game itself for just under $10 on eBay. If you're looking for the Japanese Famicom version, it's about twice that much. I'd say the game is worth more like $5, but hey, that's just my opinion. 
The game is also available on the Wii and 3DS Virtual Console, so you can play it on those if you want. There's games out there that are true pieces of feces, but are considered classics, much like Metal Gear on the NES, and this game is a part of that group. We hate these games so much, yet we love them at the same time. Much like me with some shitty games. They're so bad, yet I just can't stop myself from playing them. They're a drug. A bad drug. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. Have a happy and safe Halloween. Peace out. Oh yeah, and before I go, here's my reaction toward this game. Well, seeing that my friend Heavy Metal Gamer Show puts bloopers at the end of his videos, I thought I'd show you some of mine. I only have two because if I showed you all of them, it would be over an hour long. And I don't like people hearing me get pissed off. So, anyways, here's a couple bloopers. Hope you enjoy them. And, yeah, have an awesome Halloween, as I said a million times before. So, see ya. By now, I'm sure everyone knows the game's storyline. You, Sir Arthur the Knight, are laying with Princess Prin Prin, chilling out in your own- <laughs> Oh shit, uh, some boxes just fell in my room, if anyone was wondering what that was. You know, it reminds me of that video, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but you know that girl, she's doing that, like, webcast show, and then that, like, closet door, whatever, that sliding door behind her falls on her head. <laughs> what? Is it time you're gonna review a game everybody else has reviewed? What? You're gonna play a game that was made 20 years ago? What? You're gonna rip off the angry video game nerd even though he's a better reviewer than you'd ever hope to be? What? You're also ripping off the heavy metal gamer even though he's better than you and actually knows how to make reviews? What? You got the Japanese version even though you could have got the English version? What? You want Stone Cold to babysit you on this review? What? You want Stone Cold to stop saying what? 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 what?